Do you want to learn about psychological growth without sorting through the jargon? You're in the right place. This is the Relational Psych Podcast. I'm your host, licensed therapist Tyson Connor. On this show, we learn about the processes and theories behind personal growth and experience a little bit of it ourselves. Join me twice a month for candid conversations about therapy and psychological concepts with real mental health professionals using understandable language and simple experiments that you can try yourself. Keep in mind, this podcast does not constitute therapeutic advice, but we might help you find some. And today, we are here with Matias Massaro. Uh, Mati is a clinical psychologist who graduated from the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina and a psychiatric nurse practitioner um, completing your uh, doctorate in nursing from Vanderbilt University. He's also the founder of Cognia Health. Mati, welcome. Yeah, man. Thank you for having me, Tyson. And today we are going to answer the question, how can medication help my treatment and how do I get it? Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm all ready to discuss these things. I it's basically what I do on a daily basis and one of the things I find most fun to discuss and how collaboration between psychotherapy and medications can lead to very good results overall. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm, I'm really excited for this conversation for, for the sake of the listener um, uh, coming into this conversation. I, because I'm a psychotherapist and because of my training, I have, I know nothing about psychopharmacology, none, none at all. Um, and Mati, your training is in both psychotherapy and now also in psychiatry. And in at least, you know, in, in the way that we've done education, at least in the U.S., there's not a lot of overlap between those two schools, right? It's not common for someone to have that sort of dual experience. So um, I'm really excited to hear what that experience and background kind of how that informs your approach to what you do now yeah um great so let's 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 dive right in briefly you know uh how can medication help the listener's treatment and how do they get it <laughs> yeah of course well you know the the first easy, easy thing to address is that medications can be accessed through anybody that has quote unquote prescription benefits mm. you know somebody that um, can write prescriptions, in this case, particularly for psychotropics. So mm -hmm. there are a variety of credentials and professionals that can be prescriber clinicians, you know, including MDs, PAs, NPs, and other providers. Now, how do they work? It comes down to the details about every single medication, right? Mm. And we can obviously have a discussion and dig deep into the pharmacology and the mechanism of action of every drug, right? Sure. In fact, I love doing that. I think it's <laughs> it's my my nerdy passion and what I do in my free time because mm -hmm. I think it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, but at the same time, to to go back a few steps and sure. think how the medications and psychotherapy play together mm -hmm. we find that collaboration between those areas can be very beneficial in several examples and context circumstances mm -hmm. so the first one that comes to mind is when psychotherapy has maybe created or helped contribute to a partial response correct so mm. a proper course of psychotherapy may have been implemented on a specific client or patient, mm -hmm. regardless of diagnosis, okay? We can be talking about depression, anxiety, ADHD. And despite trying a proper course of therapy, doing everything that's, you know, recommended and evidence-based, and despite maybe the client or patient, you know, trying their hardest, mm -hmm. in some cases, that effectiveness may not be enough, and you know, mm. just to m make sure I'm, 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 I'm the psychologist in me, you know, <laughs> right. uh, speaks its mind. It, I'm not by any means saying that psychotherapy is not effective. Mm. Both psychotherapy and medications have extensive evidence showing their effectiveness. Mm -hmm. So what we see very commonly is that sometimes 
one of them in a particular context is only improving things halfway. And this happens to both of them. Uh -huh. So sometimes psychiatry, in, in my world of things, we maybe implement medication for this and that, and we see, you know, moderate improvement, but still there's a little bit of room for improvement where psychotherapy shines so much. Mm -hmm. And then the other way happens as well, where proper course of therapy has been helping, but there is still maybe not a full response or a full symptomatic remission where we're hoping to achieve our therapeutic goals with a little bit more oomph if mm. i if i'm making any sense mm -hmm, what do you mm -hmm. think tyson yeah yeah um so a, a couple things i'm thinking one is um i wanted to find one of the words you used early on you said psychotropics and psychotropics mm -hmm. and psychopharmacology for anyone who's listening who might be like what are those things those are both like psychopharmacology is the area of study around like uh, drugs that impact a mind, right? That's what the word means. Psychopharmacology, drugs that impact a mind and how we study them. Um, psychotropics, I, I can't break down the Greek and Latin roots there, but <laughs> that's another word for drugs that impact a mind. Um, so antidepressants, ADHD medications, uh, antipsychotics, mood stabilizers, the whole gamut, um, Benadryl, right? <laughs> These that's all right. have yep, that's right. uh, applications, or you can use them to impact someone's psychological functioning. That's a psychotropic. And some people have prescription privileges, which means that they are legally allowed to write a prescription and say, you know, pharmacist, give this person this controlled drug. And the kinds of people who are allowed to do that are like medical doctors, nurse practitioners. There's a few other different degrees and licenses that you can get that give you that prescribing privileges. And the majority of psychotherapists don't have them. That's there right. There are a few people who do practice psychotherapy and prescribing together at the same time. But in like the modern mental health system that we have in the US, those are two separate streams. Right? That's right. That's right. And what we've seen is that, of course, there are all kinds of situations where psychiatry could be benefited from therapy and mm. therapy could be benefited from psychotropics or psychiatry in general. And that's why, you know, I typically suggest, and I, I've mentioned this to Tyson before, that psychiatry and psychotherapy are a little bit of a dream team mm -hmm. um and mm -hmm. this is not just me being you know optimistic and and, and friendly but we have so much research mm -hmm. that has shown on one hand the efficacy of psychotherapy yep solid science and then solid science showing the efficacy behind medications and we've seen research that suggests how both of them can yield even better results mm -hmm. almost aiming to the same therapeutic goals through different angles that can be beneficial for both. So to break it down to, to you know, the daily life or, or the daily lives and the day-to-day the, the -day -day of a specific person, let's talk about ADHD for a minute, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. There are several behavioral interventions for ADHD that we have found that are extremely effective, mm -hmm. helpful, beautiful stuff, right? Now, in some cases, behavioral interventions may not be enough to address the experience or the symptoms that someone may be experiencing. Mm -hmm. So, medications could be really helpful in those cases, yeah. where we have strong evidence for several kinds of medications that could help address symptoms or the experience of ADHD for several folks. Mm -hmm. Another example that comes to my mind right now is, as we may or may not remember at times, psychotherapy, it's a little bit of a mental exercise. It requires a lot of engagement and, Absolutely. Right, and action and thought and reflection. And it, it, at the end of the day, it, it needs the client or the patient to be engaged, mm -hmm. energized, to, mm -hmm. to, to invest a, a part of themselves in their treatment and recovery and this could be particularly hard if someone m maybe didn't sleep for the past five days <laughs> right and, and and different presentations involve sleep 
mm-hmm. dysfunctions, mm-hmm. anxiety, depression, trauma-related conditions, and several others. Mania. Like, well, <laughs> yep, yep. And, and when people, let's say, haven't been sleeping well for a long time, it, it can be very challenging to do what we need to do in therapy. Mm-hmm. And I, I can't expect it from, from them, and I can't expect it from myself. I know for a fact, if I haven't slept well for a few days, man, it's going to be challenging. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. these are situations where maybe um, medications, and, and I'm not necessarily suggesting, you know, all of these cases require medications. Sure. But sometimes somebody that hasn't slept a, an hour for five days, regardless of a manic episode or not, right, could benefit from at least temporary relief mm-hmm. for a few days so that they could let's say for the lack of a better word, regroup, we get a little bit of rest. Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's reactivate therapy. Let's re-engage in whatever we have going on. But now we, at least we got a little bit of sleep. Let's see where we go from there. So these are cases where therapy and medications play very well. ADHD, sleep. Mm-hmm. I've seen many cases where anxiety or trauma things can be severe enough where people experience such degrees of hyper arousal mm-hmm. they are essentially so on edge thinking about their experience of anxiety or trauma in therapy can be so stressful uh-huh. triggering that doing the therapy becomes a little bit unmanageable Mm -hmm. and in those cases maybe we try and we try with therapy and we're not getting too much done we are we're a little bit in front of a brick wall if Mm -hmm. you will that's being very resistant and and honestly most of the times for good reason you know Mm -hmm. people experience all sorts of unfortunate experiences that create these walls that are very strong <laughs> you know yeah and and sometimes medication can help reduce a little bit of that hyper aroused state mm-hmm. so that we can feel a little bit more in control yeah i like to explain in general that these stressors won't disappear so let's say i'm very anxious about covid uh-huh. right a lot of people experience that hey, man, I'm very anxious about catching COVID or what's going on with COVID, et cetera. And when we, and and they can't do anything about it or think about it, do anything therapeutic wise. And maybe we start a, a, you know, a gentle medication for anxiety, an SSRI, which stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor. Mm -hmm. Some of those classic ones are your Prozac, Lexapro, Soloft. Mm -hmm. And maybe this medication can help decrease this extreme anxiety or stress so that we can focus on our therapy work and what people tell me is like you know man it's not like something dramatic changed and Uh covid is still there and it's still stressful but now i feel like i can handle it yeah i feel like now i can talk about it we'll work in therapy for you know long-term thought and cognitive work Mm -hmm. but now i can actually do that am i making sense so far yeah yeah Um, it sounds like you've so far you've described two similar but distinct different like situations where psychotherapy and psychiatry work really well together the first one is one where one or the other either the meds or the therapy is going like part of the way but it needs a little boost from the other right um, and then the second is this situation that we're talking about now where like the symptoms of the distress or the overwhelm or the, whatever is getting in the way of someone's like daily life is so extreme that it makes making progress in therapy difficult to impossible because the, the distress is too high. Yes. And one of the things I used to work with a lot of kids, right? Still do. (laughs) But I used to work with a lot of them. Um, And one of the things that I would talk to them about 
was the idea of, and their parents, was the idea of like taking the edge off. Mm -hmm. That a lot of times medications are really helpful for taking the edge off so that you can like approach something and That's actually right. engage with it without getting cut. <laughs> yep. No, I, I, I agree. And essential, like you said, in some cases, the collaboration helps balance each other out towards mm -hmm. maybe that partial response on either option could benefit from extra help. It's, and that's where I see a little bit of therapy and psychiatry is a shoe or a sock for each feet. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Or, and we can, you know, walk a little better if we have one on, on, yeah. on each feet. Um, and in some cases, like you suggested, yeah, things can be pretty acute sometimes in mental yeah. health. So we have cases of extreme substance dependence. Mm -hmm. We have s situations where somebody feels frequently suicidal or has suicidal ideations or actions that are pretty significant and, and, in, and debilitating, mm -hmm. where we might want to collaborate between therapy and, and, and medications. And then we have situations where therapy has been extremely effective, like specific phobias, for example. Uh -huh. And in, in those cases, therapy has been very effective, but at the same time, it also takes a little bit of time to get going. Right. You know, exposure therapy and things that have been found to be so effective might benefit from a medication, at least temporarily, mm -hmm. while we address long-term the specific phobia. Am I making any sense here? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm thinking about, like, uh, a listener who might be listening to this and is wondering, like, should I look into medication, right? whether they're in therapy or not, right? It sounds like one of the things that I'm hearing you say is if you've been in therapy for a while and you've hit a plateau, yes, maybe look into seeing if medication would help it along. Alternatively, I'm also hearing you say, if you're in therapy and you're having a really hard time getting started because it's so distressing, yes, medication might be helpful to get the ball rolling. That's right. Yep. I, I agree with that. And to your point of like, maybe in these situations, it could be helpful to bring mm. on a medication. And you're right about that. And I think the, the other half of that um, idea is that a psychiatric evaluation in general, a consult with psychiatry, can be helpful in a few more ways than just a medication point. So mm. for example, psychiatric providers have been trained in several biomedical related underlying things uh -huh. so a lot of times some of these things influence our mental health experience right so maybe we have plateaued in therapy mm -hmm. in working around our depression experience sure and we are not sure what's going on we made some improvements but it's getting a little rough during a psychiatric consult, sure, you know, we can discuss medications that could be helpful, but during the assessment, we might start finding hints of underlying biomedical conditions that could play a role in this. Mm -hmm. For example, thyroid dysfunctions, mm -hmm. like hypothyroidism, uh -huh. are a very common factor that influences mental health in general. So hypothyroidism can often lead to depressed mood and mm. or as eventually contribute to a full-on diagnosis of major depressive disorder. Uh -huh. So there are different biomedical variables and items that have an influence on our mental health experience, including our thyroid, iron levels, maybe chronic conditions like diabetes and its influence in mental health, mm -hmm. pregnancy, a person that goes through pregnancy goes through several changes in their body and metabolism, and they may or may not have a, a, an important influence in our mental health. Mm -hmm. Chronic pain is another. So trying to understand hormones, our thyroid, and some of those things can be extremely important to influence our overall progress in our right. therapeutic goals. 
I'm I'm remembering I'm having a memory to back to grad school mm-hmm. when I was learning about diagnosis and how to go about diagnosing, and um, the the professor who was teaching the class she would tell us you always have to rule out the organic factor. Yes, and for listeners, the organic factor just means like something's happening in this person's body, mm-hmm. right? So psychosis it right is like big scary word and it means that someone is experiencing hallucinations or delusions disconnects from reality different kinds of experiences all sorts of things and something that our my professor loved to remind us is that the vast majority of people who are diagnosed with psychosis it is because something is happening to their body it's not because they have a major mental health issue that's surfacing. It's because they were in a motorcycle accident and got hit on the head. Or it's because some hormones in their body got unbalanced. Yes. I once worked with a, with a client for a couple of months who was, uh, they, they were younger. This was in community mental health. And they just like moved across the country. And when they landed here, they had these like, psychotic symptoms this mm-hmm. paranoia um delusions and hallucinations and they went to their medical doctor i was working with them and like all right i'm gonna put on my big therapist pants and i'm gonna like get into the psychosis they went to their doctor and they got a vitamin shot right and then they were like hey, bye tyson i don't need you they were fine <laughs> that's it right. all went away yeah, that's right um so b- part of what i'm hearing you say is that like going to a uh Someone who's been trained in psychopharmacology yes. means you're going to someone who is aware of all of these kinds of physiological embodied medical factors that like your standard psychotherapist like me probably isn't. Um, and, and also that maybe your primary care physician is, doesn't have the specific training about either. Right. So in, in maybe in this particular case, we assess and maybe do some diagnostics, right? Mm-hmm. And diagnostics can be lab work. They can be imaging. They can be genetic panels. We can do a, a sleep test, a polysomnography to, you know, possibly assess for sleep apnea that's contributing to these sleep dysfunctions in anxiety or depression. Uh-huh. And, you know, maybe we see, oh, hey, our, our, our thyroid levels are pretty low. Well, I think we might be onto something here, and you mm-hmm. meet the certain other symptoms, and you know we talked about your family history, and it sounds like your mom and your grandfather have a history of hypothyroidism, so you know we might be onto something, and then let's say we gather everything to make that diagnosis of hypothyroidism, we maybe introduce a medication, typically it all you know it varies case by case, but most of the times it's a synthetic thyroid mm-hmm. that we just add to our um to our bodies to increase our thyroid levels overall in our bodies and by readjusting our necessary thyroid functions we start noticing that our mood improves mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and we and you know and a cascade of other things like for example they notice that they might have a little more energy that mm-hmm. they're not putting on weight for no reason mm-hmm. um so that could be it and then we notice significant major improvements and then that has an enabling effect on therapy as well right so in some cases we may not do a psychiatric medication a psychotropic but we find that there's an underlying history or an underlying influential factor that's contributing to either their mental health experience or possibly the primary culprit if you will Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah yeah i just had an analogy pop into my head let me Mm -hmm. know if this is uh off and wrong but it it kind of makes me think like if if you're hungry right and you go to a chef and they keep giving you good food you say chef i'm hungry and then they make this meal for you and they give it to you but you just can't eat it you just can't eat it and it's because you have like a toothache Sure. And you need a tooth extracted. Yeah. Right. Then like that, that it sounds like that's kind of the relationship between like psychotherapy, psychotherapist being the chef and psychiatry sometimes. Where yeah. Like the dentist will be like, yo, this is great food you're getting, but you can't take it down <laughs> because right. you have this massive toothache. That's right. Yep. Yep. 
and and sometimes it's more than one thing you know your right. tooth is hurting and you know let's let's see how we can decrease the pain so and then you know oh we realize that you you have a little bit of a genetic m- m- you know Im- influential factor that makes it hard for you to swallow right so not only your tooth is hurting but it sounds and it looks like from what i'm assessing that it's it's very hard to swallow uh-huh. food and well, we can do stuff about it. <laughs> right. So to, to stretch the analogy maybe to its breaking point, that's when the dentist would turn to the chef and say, stop giving this guy hamburgers <laughs> right. and maybe make a soup. Right? That's right. That's do you ever right. find that where you like discover, like through your assessment of a person, you realize, oh, here's this factor we weren't aware of. And then you go to their psychotherapist and say, um, or like you should change what you're doing because of this thing we discovered. Is that part of how you work? It it can happen. Um, mm-hmm. Typically, m- most therapists are, are you know working very appropriately and right. well, yeah, and yeah, yeah. and they're doing everything that that makes sense. And every now and then, we discover something significant that you know it could it could suggest an adjustment or an addition to what mm-hmm. they're working on. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it 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 can be informative to to us, and that's why the the collaboration piece can be so important if we keep yeah this communication open between us we can wear all the same jerseys and you know be part of the same team and help the client or patient improve a little bit you know maybe yeah. this, this is unfortunately common you know mm. where we see a lot of clients or patients who identify as female mm. and they experience chronic pelvic pain you mm. know mm-hmm. that can be very debilitating in their daily routine and or sex lives, correct? Yeah. And it can be something so stressful that it's a common theme in therapy, mm. right? And maybe then they, through a medical assessment, through a, 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 a consult with an OB or women's health provider, let's say during diagnostics, there might be, let's say, a little nodule, a little something that was yeah. like, oh, well, now it makes sense that you were having pain. Uh-huh. We, 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 we found something. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> so kind of like your tooth analogy, right? And right. we're like, okay, let's see what we can do. And little did we know that there are medications in psychiatry that can address some of these both mood concerns and chronic pain. Mm-hmm. So based on these factors, we try to pick our drug and see mm-hmm. how it could help the most. Am I making sense here? Yeah, absolutely. Totally. Awesome. Yeah, it sounds like part of, part of the benefit of talking to a prescriber is getting this more, like, it is broadening the scope of what you're looking at and what you're thinking about and what you're talking about to more of the body. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Bringing in, you know, the, the general physiology and, and, and bio, biological factors that could be contributing at a large scale yeah. and that also could be addressed to enable the progress in therapy and ultimately both play a, a key role. You know, yeah. medications can enable this progress, can make things feel a little bit more in control. And at the same time, therapy will be most likely what will create and contribute to the best long-term outcomes. Right. You know, now that we can, now that you've slept, Uh let's talk about what's stressing you. Let's figure out coping mechanisms. Let's talk about preventive strategies for next time you go spend Christmas with your in-laws, right? (laughs) Or, or anything that contributes to any sort of anxiety. So yeah, they are a little bit like of, Two shoot two shoes for each feet, right. you know, foot. Um, so that's kind of how I how I see it a little bit. And this team approach has people with similar skills and at the same time different trainings that can address multiple times, multiple things. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know, having a, a little bit of a football or basketball team and you know, one of you guys plays defense, one of you guys plays offense, one of you guys is the goalie, and, uh-huh. you know, we're all doing our, our role to win this game, in a way. <laughs> right. Yeah. It sounds like, in the way that you work with uh, medications, 
there are some situations where people are taking meds for a little while and mm-hmm. then the therapy does the work of making the underlying changes to address the issue. But it sounds like there are also situations where someone might be on meds for a long time, That's maybe right. the rest of their life. Can you talk about like the difference between those two situations? Yeah, of course, Dyson. And it's obviously a very case-by-case situation, right? right? Yeah. Let's talk about maybe using an example that's very relatable to most people, um, like depression or anxiety, mm-hmm. right? One of our probably most common consults are depression, anxiety, because unfortunately they're very common, right? right? Yeah. So we've seen and, and learned through time that people experience depression or anxiety at a frequent or recurrent rate or sometimes at an episodic rate. Mm. Sometimes people who experience a major depressive episode, mm-hmm. they've experienced it, let's say, once, and therapy was helpful, and you know they they keep on with their lives perfectly great, uh-huh. right? Yep, yep. Now other people experience major depressive episodes pretty frequently, mm-hmm. and they've experienced them not only frequently but for long periods. So maybe instead of someone who experienced a major depressive episode for two weeks some folks experience it for two months Mm. and maybe that episode could be pretty acute Mm -hmm. so sometimes one course of treatment can be beneficial effective and some folks have these one or two episodes and you know good for them and that's it they may or may not require or be appropriate to continue the prescription for medications right in other cases where these episodes are recurrent frequent very long very intense it might be beneficial to keep the medication longer Mm. so Mm. what we found through through research is that once we try let's say a medication for depression or anxiety Mm -hmm. typically our first line are these ssris like lexapro prozac so loved Mm -hmm. what we've learned is that it's protective and effective to take them for something around 12 to 18 months okay we've learned that if we stop them earlier than that there's a bigger chance that we may re-experience an episode. Uh In a way, we're hoping to set people up for success so that once they finish this course of treatment, we don't have an episode again. Right. Those who experience those so frequently for so long and more acutely may benefit from a longer route of treatment for a more sustained treatment that will prevent these major depressive episodes uh-huh. or decrease their duration, their intensity, and their frequency. Mm-hmm. So in some cases like these, it could be appropriate and recommended to, you know, we've, exper- we, we've learned together that we've experienced these episodes at this intensity pretty frequently and they've been very debilitating. How would you feel if we continue this treatment for a little longer so that we can decrease this? Mm -hmm. Am I making sense here? Yeah, yeah. It sounds like uh, it's it's interesting. I wasn't familiar. I think, listener and and Mati, we're going to do an episode in the future about SSRI specifically, Mm -hmm. I think, because they are such a common um, thing. It's like it's I, I feel like most primary care physicians have are probably comfortable prescribing them. I feel like most people who try medications, if it's not for ADHD, and even sometimes if it is, they'll get started on an SSRI. So stay tuned, listener. Future episode, we'll get more into those specifically. But um, I'd never heard the like 12 to 18 month thing before. That's interesting to me that uh, that. And it makes sense because like antibiotics have a similar thing, right? Like a lot shorter, but you try to, you want to use an antibiotic all the way through to the end so that you get the full dose even, and so that you get the full effect. Yes. Even if you start feeling better before the end of that course. That's right. If you stop it early, it can make the trouble come back and sometimes worse. Yeah. Sounds like there are 
there are psychotropics that work that way too. And in some situations, and it sounds like it really is case by case. It is. Some situations, people will be on meds for a little bit, and then they'll get what they need from it, and they'll be done. Yeah. Some people, they'll be on meds for a little while, and then it sounds like it's a conversation. It, it is. It sounds like you don't, like, in a first appointment with someone, know, all right, I'm going to have you on meds for the next decade. <laughs> right? like, that's it right. It sounds like it's an that's ongoing right. thing. Yeah, that's right. And that's what I tell everybody that comes my way. Not only this is uh, an alliance and, and a collaborative approach where mm-hmm. my role here is to give you my best clinical recommendation, and that is as far as I go. You are the driver here. I'm your co-pilot. And I will tell you what my science map tells me. But at the end of the day, it's your body, it's your treatment. I want you to have all cards on the table, pros Uh and cons for each option. And, you know, make make an informed choice. And I'll be here guiding and supporting and making sure that things are safe as well. Uh And not set things in stone for you. And Mm -hmm. this is only this is not only important for our initial appointment, but for the future too. So people need to know that, or or be encouraged to know that things shouldn't be set in stone. So let's say we meet for the first time and we are excited to try an antidepressant. Mm -hmm. But if we change our minds in a month, that's okay. Yeah, We can discuss about it too and see where we go from there. We go back to the drawing board and we see how we feel. So that's the important part and piece of the conversation where like, hey, I'm very excited that now you're feeling better. I'm, you're thriving. You're doing amazing. These past three months, you're, you, I hear that you're feeling back like yourself, and that's awesome. And I also hear that you, you, you're, you're ready to stop the medication. And, you know, I, I respect that. I will bring up this information and the science behind it. Mm-hmm. I will you know, based on this science, recommend that we stay a little bit longer on it because it will set you up for success and prevent a a, a future episode in the near future. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, you make the call, you know? Yeah. If you want to stop it now, we'll work on it. And, you know, I'll, I'll help you stop it because typically we recommend a progressive discontinuation. Right. That is also something we found can be protective of mm-hmm. future episodes, and it can be a safer way to discontinue a medication because some people may experience discomfort if they stop a medication cold turkey. Yeah, but it's still an option for you, and if otherwise you would like to continue it, yeah, we'll continue it. And most people, in my experience, they they hear the recommendation, they see what the science is behind it, and they're like, yeah. I, you know, I, 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 I came here thinking it would be a good time to stop it, but the science makes sense. And, mm-hmm. and, it, you know, I'll, I'll continue taking it just because last time I felt this way, it sucked right. and I don't want to do it again. Right. And I'm like, hey, it's your call. You know, both are, both options are on the table. Here's all the information. I'll help you whichever way you prefer. Mm-hmm. Am I making sense here? Yeah, absolutely. And it, it, part of what I'm hearing is that, like, for our listener, if you're if you're talking to your prescriber and you're feeling like they're just telling you how it's going to be, like, do this and then talk to me in a month or whatever, then maybe that's not a uh, maybe that's a therapeutic relationship that you might want to question (laughs) (laughs) sounds like the way that you practice at least and the way that you recommend people practice i imagine is one that is a little bit more collaborative a more of like a team-based approach with the idea of like the patient or the client the listener in this case (laughs) as as the one who makes the final decision and then your your role then is to be like the one with the expertise and the training and the experience and to make your suggestions based on your best clinical judgment. But at the end of the day, the person is the one who has agency over their own body. They're the one who decides what's going to happen one way or the other. Yes. And you're going to give them all the options that you believe are available to them. Yes. And discussing, you know, pros, cons and cards on the table. Mm -hmm. And I, hell, Hey, I will, 
be here supporting you whichever way you prefer. I, you know, I, I think that's the safe way to do it. And that's my way to practice. But it is your call. And in your line of thought, I always encourage patients, clients, and other providers to remember that we don't have to make a decision right there, right now. Mm -hmm. I think all of us, and myself, when I'm a patient to other clinicians, I think we've, we've been modeled to think that we have to tell the clinician right there what yeah. we want to do. And some of these are heavy things that we want to think about. So that's what I recommend in general. So during the first appointment or whatnot, once we talked about everything and it's my time to give a little bit of feedback and my clinical recommendation, I encourage people to take their time. Mm -hmm. So, hey, you know what? We talked a little bit about everything today. Some of these things were actually a little heavy. You know, they were mm -hmm. on traumatic things and whatnot. So... You don't have to start the medication or tell me what you want to do today if that was the recommendation, of course. There are times where we don't recommend the medication. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Take your time, you know, think about it, sleep on it, talk to your mom, talk to your partner, talk to your friend, and send me a message in a few days. Yeah. I like to send little PDF files with psychoeducational material about every medication I recommend. Cool. You know, that's a little bit of a starting point yeah. for people to learn a little bit about the recommendation and not just take a decision blindly if mm -hmm. you will and also a little bit to give them a starting place with information because i think we all have googled random stuff and we end up finding out that our our final diagnosis is that we are a pokemon <laughs> 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 you know so it's good to you know we we can't stop people from from sure dark web googling yeah, you know yeah, but yeah. <laughs> but we can at least give them a starting point that's with a little bit more official in clinical information mm -hmm. and from there they can do their research and tyson to be honest what happens most of the time it's people come back a day or two later uh -huh. they message me and they're like hey man you know what i talk to my best friend and they find they, they told me they take the same medication uh-huh i'm like really yeah and you know they they weren't very they they didn't feel like talking about it but now that i opened up they opened up about it and they told me how much this helped them and now i'm pumped like i uh -huh. like can we start it i'm like yeah, yeah of course and you know well, let's let's check it back in in a, f in a few days weeks whatever the case is mm -hmm. and see where we go but i do think they should be the protagonist of their treatment i think it's a matter of agency and empowerment but i think it's also maybe one of the most important parts of recovery where we are responsible for our healing. Mm. I think it's important that we are the ones that are choosing to heal ourselves in whatever is going on yeah. and that we are the ones that are doing the healing. Sure, we have some cheerleaders, you know, mm -hmm. our therapist, our psychiatric provider, they're giving us some sh some shoes, some socks. Our therapist is constantly giving us some some of those little water cups every time uh, we yeah. take a lap. But they are the runner here. They are the protagonist, and they should be the ones that hopefully feel that I am doing the work. Right. I am responsible for the improvements that I'm noticing. Mm -hmm. Am I making sense here? Yeah. Yeah. No, I like that a lot, and I think. I, I think a lot of our listeners will hopefully feel encouraged or at least less afraid of medication management and talking to a prescriber, hearing this way of thinking about it. I think um, what, what I hear from a lot of folks who are considering medications uh, is a fear that they're just going to be put on something. Right. That some they're going to walk in, fill out like a questionnaire, and then someone's going to be give them a, a prescription and say, see you in six weeks. Right. And, and there won't be this dialogue and mm -hmm. there won't be there. There won't be that time to think mm -hmm. and there won't be that relationship. And I, I think I think a lot of people are afraid of that because honestly, that's been their experience. Yes. Um, and honest and and like in my experience, the people who are most freaked out about that are oftentimes people who were on medications when they were younger. Because especially for kids, like if the doctor is having that relationship with someone, oftentimes it's with the parents. 
Yes. And so kids can, can get over medicated that way and can feel like they have no conversation. And then that, that becomes what people expect from, from their medication management. And it sounds like what you're suggesting is like a, a pretty significant left turn away from that sort of authoritarian. Mm. I'm going to tell you what to do like clinical in, in the sense of like sterile and detached. Yes. Like that, that, that might be something that people have had experiences with. And it sounds like you're working to avoid falling into that particular trap. I, I, I sure hope so. It's, it's definitely my intention and my hope that we can, we can have a different model. You know, I think what you describe is what I, I joke around calling the car shop model mm. where mm-hmm. we, you know, we, we go to the car shop or the mechanic, we drop our car for, for a 15 minute appointment and they make, a, you know, a few questions, a, a quick little screening tool and okay, here's your oil change and a quick dose adjustment, go home. Uh-huh. And man, I don't think that's good. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, I think we need to talk about what's going on to understand the experience of mental health this person is telling us to understand Mm -hmm. how we can make an impact with or without medications, how we can recommend therapy, how we could talk about exercise, nutrition, sleep, sex, Uh and everything that could be influenced, maybe doing some loves, like I suggested, Mm -hmm. seeing how, let's say that thyroid's working, Mm -hmm. maybe Mm -hmm. assessing a little bit of everything and trying to understand that and, you know, I, I, I think we've we've all fallen into this vicious cycle of a medical model where shorter appointments were maybe the default and there's mm-hmm. a long we can have a whole discussion about this. Some of our listeners might be wondering, um, okay, this sounds pretty good. Uh Tyson, Mati, great idea. Um how do I get this kind of medication management? So, I mean, one option would be for people to Google you. Of right? course. <laughs> Links are to you are in the show notes. <laughs> but um, let's say someone's listening who's in, you know, New Hampshire, right? Sure. Or like, or, or your caseload is full because everyone's heard this episode and you're <laughs> <laughs> like, how would you recommend someone go about looking for yes. a prescriber? who will try to avoid some of those pitfalls we were talking about. Yeah. Like how do you find medication management? That's this like more holistic, yes. thoughtful, less low pressure. It's tricky, mm-hmm. but it's possible. And my recommendation is to, if possible, start by asking a provider you trust. Mm-hmm. That might be your therapist. That might be your primary care provider who might right. start engaging in that kind of treatment or prefer to refer to therapy or a psychiatric specialist. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's your OBGYN or your woman's health provider. Sure. Sometimes it's a midwife that you used three years ago. (laughs) Right, right. But a provider you trust may be a great starting point because they may know and trust a colleague. They may be like a, a therapist that you've been working for a few months or so. And when you are exploring this conversation, maybe your therapist knows someone or mm. they can help you find one because yeah. they already have, a, you know, both feet in the, in the field, right. <laughs> in the mental health field. Yeah. So, of course, you can Google, you can do all sorts of things and, of course, feel free to do so. I think starting by asking someone that you trusted before, a provider that's helped you before, could be a good starting point. Yeah. If you have the unfortunate experience that you haven't found one yet, you don't see a therapist or you mm-hmm. don't have a primary care provider, well, in that case, it might be good to start looking at searches like online, Psychology Today, and other specialized web search engines for mental health providers Mm -hmm. and read their descriptions, read their websites, see if something resonates with you and give it a try. But what, what would you recommend to, to clients or patients you see when they might want to explore a psychiatric consult? Yeah. Yeah. I think if people come to me, then 
usually I will I will refer, right? I'll refer to you <laughs> now. <laughs> You'll be on the list, right? And and honestly, like there were a few years where I knew some prescribers in the area I worked, right. and then I moved to a different area. Mm-hmm. I didn't know the prescribers there, um, but I did get plugged into certain professional communities, and then I started to learn of people's reputations. That's right. right? So um, I started referring people to folks who I'd never had an individual conversation with, but I I knew from going to conferences and seeing them there and hearing other colleagues talk about how how helpful they'd been with another client. So that's that's how I did my referrals, and I I agree. I think that like the way that mental health providers market themselves uh, online is like important it's important to try to communicate this is who i am this is how i practice and if you're not savvy to what all of the like buzzwords mean and imply about how someone works it can be really confusing to try to understand and to read like profiles on psychologytoday.com if you're not familiar with the world of psychotherapy and you're reading through psychotherapist profiles yes they all sound exactly the same (laughs) that's right they are exactly the same that's right so um when (laughs) <laughs> when I've had the unfortunate situation of working from scratch with literally no information, I've honestly told people, like, go on their profiles, read it, maybe schedule like a consult call sure. if they offer that, and then just trust your gut. Yes, that's like, right. If you're reading someone's like blurb that they've written about themselves and it's all Greek to you, but something in your gut is like, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I like the way this person uses commas. Right. <laughs> that's right. It is. That's right. <laughs> like, I I think that's actually really valuable. Oh, I think that gut feeling is fundamental too because people might be in front of the I'm most amazingly trained clinician, and they might not find it a good fit. And, and hey, that clinician might fit extremely well with a million other clients or patients, but it might not be the click for you. Right. So r- regardless of training, education, and skill, gut feeling is a big factor too. And, mm-hmm. and of course, you know, I encourage you to see someone who's educated and trained and certified. Right. Yeah. But I'm saying gut feeling will probably be one of the most important factors in saying, okay, you know, Mm-hmm. I, I I feel I feel comfortable and confident that this is the setting for me. Is there a specific like introductory resource that you would point people to who have this very broad general like medications for mental health care? <laughs> like that's you know that's a great question because I don't have one, oh. which is why I want to work on one. Yeah, that's oh. my my upcoming project is to work on that introductory material for clients and patients because one, I think it's fun. And two, because otherwise I repeat the same information all day. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I can, I can point out to, Hey, you know, I, I made a quick video or, or wrote this little article explaining this about Lexapro or uh-huh. SSRIs in general at a, at a friendly level, introductory level that can help both either patients, clients, or maybe at a level that could be helpful for therapists yeah. that, you know, they are very savvy of, of, of mental health in general, but they may want to learn more about specifically psych- psychiatry or psychopharmacology. Right. Yeah, well, listener, watch this space, because as soon as Mati finishes <laughs> whatever one of these are, we will plug it, because that sounds really useful and like something that there would be... there. It, it sounds like something that would really serve a need, right? I like, hope so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, thank you for coming on the podcast. We, we will have you back. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm excited to, to keep learning about this stuff because it feels like, genuinely, this feels like a, an integrated way of doing mental health care that sidesteps maybe one of the weirdly more like tension filled like divisions in mental health care in it it, in my experience at least in in the greater seattle area right there is this kind of psychotherapists tend to be a little bit like "Eh, medications Mm -hmm. and a lot of medical providers tend to be like "Eh, talk therapy that's right yeah and like 
what I love about this, this way that you're talking about doing it is that it's like truly integrative, which to me feels like the obvious thing to do. <laughs> that's right. That, that's why I, I talk about shoes and, and teamwork. Right. And it's, it's it, the way I see it is, it's, it's salt and pepper. You know, mm -hmm. we, 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 we use both. They're both excellent and they both have different properties that lead to a great meal <laughs> and, and that yeah, great yeah. deal, you know, we, we deal with a great outcome and, and with improved therapeutic goals. And it's, it's unfortunate that we've come to this divide. Yeah. Um, because that's also not what science has shown us. Right. Both are extremely effective and both are effective together. So mm -hmm. collaborating on them, sounds like the way to go to me see that's the bit that makes me pull my hair out it's <laughs> like and and this is true for like so many things in mental health treatment is that like every camp you know the emdr people have their evidence oh, that's right the psycho psychoanalytic people have their evidence that's the right. cbt people have their evidence and i'm like great look at all these things that work right, <laughs> right right but but the the feeling is like look at the proof that my thing works Right. And, and this sounds like a way of being like, yeah, guys, look at all the stuff that works. Let's That's right. try to let it work together. <laughs> That's right. For the sake of the patient. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. It, it, it's like discussing, you know, what's better, salt and pepper. Like I said, right. well, you know, they're both awesome. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, exactly. and, and we use them together for pretty much everything. So right. let's, let's be, you know, a, a little more reasonable and, and an open minded and, mindful of the science right and you know set set people up for success that's that's the bottom line right totally. like we we want to work together be part of the defense be part of the offense and help clients or patients feel a little better that's that's the bottom line right the to, to the listener like you are living your whole life and we can help you with the parts that we know about and the parts that you show us and the parts that we have our own specialized training and understanding about. But you want to live your whole life. We don't want to just focus on, on one way of, of treating to the exclusion of all others. That's right. Thank you for coming. We're going to wrap this up because we've hit over an hour of recording. <laughs> so this will be a long one. And um, I look forward to having you back and continuing this conversation. This is exciting. Yeah, I, I, I'm excited too. This is fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Special thanks to Matias Massaro. Matias can be found at his website, cogniahealth.com. The link to his website is in the show notes. There is no experiment for this episode. Try as we might, neither Matias nor I could think of a responsible way to assign an experiment involving psychotropics. If you think you may benefit from psychopharmacological intervention, consult with your primary care provider or psychiatric prescriber. For further learning, we actually recommend Matisse's website, CogniaHealth.com, link in the show notes, where he will be publishing blogs, videos, and podcast episodes of his own all about the topics we discussed in this episode. This podcast is scheduled to release right around the time that Matisse is hoping to have launched his website, so I'm as excited as you are to see what he puts up there. In two weeks, we'll be speaking with Matisse again, this time specifically about SSRIs, the most commonly prescribed psychiatric medication. So if this conversation interested you, but you're curious to get more into the weeds about a particular medication, consider giving that one a listen. The Relational Psych Podcast is a production of Relational Psych, a mental health clinic providing depth-oriented psychotherapy and psychological testing in person in Seattle and virtually throughout Washington State. If you are interested in psychotherapy or psychological testing for yourself or a family member, links to our contact information are in the show notes. If you are a psychotherapist and would like to be a guest on the show, or are a listener with a suggestion for someone you'd like us to interview, you can contact me at podcast at relationalpsych.group. The Relational Psych Podcast is hosted and produced by me, Tyson Connor. Carly Claney is our executive producer, with technical support by Sam Claney and Allie Ray. Our music is by Ben Lewis. We love you, buddy. <laughs>